Good time with Basun. Thank you. Good morning, guys. Great to be here. It's great to have such a booming voice, which means please turn me down a bit. <laughs> Good morning. It really is great to be with you. When we, when we started this year, when we entered this year, and then I think a bit of a cautious entry um, into 2021 after a rather tumultuous 2020, we did say that coming into this year, we need, as a people, we need to focus on being or on becoming an overcoming people. We need to be focusing this year on being or becoming an overcoming people. The church of Jesus Christ, the people that belong to Christ, or as we are often referred to in the book of Acts, the people of the way, will be an overcoming people. It's great to see you guys at home as well. Sorry, uh, although Jean mentioned you, thank you for joining us. So the people of the way will indeed be an overcoming people. How do I know this? I know this because I have it on really good authority. The Bible, Revelation 19, it says the following. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like that of a roar of rushing waters, like peals of thunder shouting hallelujah for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad in him and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Just focus on that one. Why don't you just say that one with me? For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride, that's us, has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. And then the angel said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. So when Jesus says, I am the truth, the way and the life, the, life, the way, the truth and the life. When the truth speaks the truth, you can be guaranteed that it is indeed true. Not that the truth would ever not speak the truth. But I love this, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. So that beckons the question, or it can almost lull us into some form of perhaps false security. Because we start off by saying we need to become, we need to prepare ourselves to be an overcoming people. But then we go to the back end of the book and we see, but we are an overcoming people. It's once again, we, we're watching a, a rugby match knowing the, the end result. I was yesterday watching um, just a, a brief recap on what you might have seen, a game between um, um, uh, one of the minnows, who were they, um, the cheetahs, playing the sharks. And I so enjoyed the game, because I knew the end result. <laughs> In any event, <laughs> so the, the thing is, what does it say that if we kick off the year by saying we need to become an overcoming people, but already it's guaranteed. So immediately we can get into that place where we say, what, so what's the big deal? If God says, God's word says that it's going to happen, then it's going to happen. If the truth, speaking the truth, says that it's going to happen, then surely we can kick back, we can relax, we can just wait for Jesus to come to mount the white horse, which we also read of in Revelation 19, to come through the heavens and to come for this bride that has prepared herself. We can kind of just wait for all of this to happen, perhaps swaying gently in the wind, sipping a pina colada, while we wait. Not quite. You see, that's, that's where we have to read the entire word. We have to take all the truths of the word and hold them in tension. And so I want to touch on some of the other truths that we also find in the Word of God. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes, obviously, to Timothy, his second letter, and he gives this warning. He says, mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, but treacherous, rash, conceited, 
lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And then he says, have nothing to do with them. Have nothing to do with them. Now, when we read this, we immediately think of, of those out there. Die sondags, wat nou nie hier is vir ochend in die kerk, in die huis van die Heere nie. Somehow, you know, it's, it's, it was written for them. Those guys out there. It's almost as if Paul is warning Timothy against the Satanists. Uh, and, and somehow I don't, don't think that was quite it. So I, I don't think, why, why would Paul have to warn Timot- Timothy to stop hanging out with Satanists? I don't think that was quite his nature. No, no, I think Paul was writing this and he was speaking to those much closer to him. I think he was referring to some other people actually being part of that local church. Why would I say something like that? Why else would Paul tell him to not hang out with them, to avoid them? Why, would, why else would Paul refer to them as those having a form of godliness but denying its power? At the same time, I'm also reminded of when Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and he warned them. In fact, he reminded them. He said to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel which I, he's not talking about a gospel which they've heard somewhere else. He says, I want to remind you of the gospel which I, Paul, preached to you. I've preached it to you, you've received it, and you've taken your stand on this gospel. He says, by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word that I've preached to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. He says, for what I've received I've passed on to you as a first important, importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day also according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then later on to the twelve and he says later on, and then he appeared even to me. So, what we can see here, the Apostle Paul clearly is is writing to the church. He is clearly writing to believers. He's writing to believers to whom he has personally preached the gospel. They heard the gospel from Paul's lips. They believe it. They took their stand on it, and they started to walk a journey. They started this journey of cutting off the old and of walking towards... Christ's likeness. They started a journey of sanctification. But then he warns them in this portion. He says, unless they continued, unless they continue with this journey of faithfulness, unless they prevail right to the end, they would have believed in vain. That's a, that's a harsh statement. Is there anyone here that has run the Comrades Marathon? Wonderful. I'm so glad. I was quite nervous when Sean wasn't here to ask that question. Yeah. Helena, uh, how would you be able to prove to me that you've run the Comrades Marathon? You see, the medal is the thing. If you ran the Comrades and you somehow, I don't know, bombed out or, or decided not to finish or for some reason, medically or whatever, would it be fair for you to get a medal? And so somehow, you know, when we read this portion from, from Paul, it sounds harsh. You've, you've started this race, but unless you complete it, you've started in vain. Someone told me, I can't remember who it was, that a friend of his somehow ended quite close to the front of, of the start. I think it was Francois that told me this story. Uh, start of, of, the, of the comrades. And uh, as the, the gun went off, as that whoever he was did the, the crowing, um, he started running, and he wasn't quite ready yet. He wasn't quite warmed up yet. But then there was the, the motorbikes and the camera, so he, he felt that he, he really had to give it his all. So he thought he was he's just going to sprint out with, with the front runners for the first kilometer or so, really give it horns, and then later he'll just catch his breath. However, within 500 meters, he pulled a hamstring. And so that was the end of his race, sadly. So, okay, that wasn't all that relevant. The, the, the point is, 
The point is, Paul starts and he, he reminds them to not only start but to finish well. It sounds so much like that, that quote from Dr. Paul Beck, which I used, I think it was last week, when he says, Stay true to Jesus. Make sure that you keep your heart close to Jesus every day because it's a long way from here to where you are going to go to and Satan is in no hurry to get you. And then, of course, I'm, I'm still building a case here where I'm saying that according to Revelation, there will be a great multitude that have prevailed, that are ready, that have made themselves ready, that have prepared themselves as the bride of Christ. And yet there are a number of warnings, and all of these are taken from the New Testament, please note. But the, the toughest one of the lot for me is the words of Jesus himself. Where Jesus himself says in Matthew the following. He says, by their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn trees or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good fruit. Bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. And then this is it. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. And then the clincher, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and your name drive our demons, and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. These must be the most sobering words of the entire New Testament. And they are spoken by Jesus himself. These must be the most sobering words of the entire Bible. Spoken again by Jesus himself. So I trust that I have your attention. By now, we should realize that we will not be those people who prevail right to the end just because we believe in God. The point, the theme for this year is being, becoming a people that prevails to the end. When Jesus returned, he says, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? And this is a scary sentence. And when I, when I type that, I wasn't too sure whether it's even biblical. We should realize that we will not necessarily be those who prevail right to the end just be because we believe in Jesus. And I'm sure a number of you are quite nervous about that statement. We have to outwork daily the inward working of the Holy Spirit. And this is why James, the, the physical brother of Jesus, wrote the following in James chapter 2. He says, Faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. And so going back to that statement of mine, it says, it is not enough for us to believe in God. It's not enough to us, for us to believe that there is one God for us to prevail. Because here, James says, even the demons know and believe that, and they shudder. And so we get to this place where we have to ask the question, what then shall we do? How then shall we live? Which, interestingly enough, is exactly the opening question of almost the book of Acts. It's the it's the first question that is asked by the crowd in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is poured out, the crowd is drawn, and then Peter starts to speak to the crowd, and he, he reminds them of some of these things. He reminds them that they, in fact, crucified the Messiah. And they ask this question, 
What shall we do? Brothers, what shall we do? When the people heard this, they, this is Peter's explanation, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus and for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children, for all those who are far off. For all of those whom the Lord will call. And with many other words, he pleaded with them. He warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. If ever we as believers are surrounded by a corrupt generation, it is now. If ever we as believers need to switch off the autopilot of our Christianity and get serious and intentional about our walk with God, it is right now. So in the light of this, in the light of what we've said, in the light of the case that we are building here, I want us to look again at some of the building blocks that I mentioned probably in the very first Sunday of the year. Building towards becoming, being a prevailing people. We mentioned that the building blocks that we will touch on, five of them, with purity, prayer, presence, power, and prevailing. And sadly, unfortunately, as much as I would have loved this to be a formula, it's not a formula. I can't guarantee for us that if we, if we can grab those five things, if we can take purity and prayer and the presence of God and the power of God, we will prevail. If we can get those five things, get them into an oven preheated at 180 for two hours later, we will be a people that prevail right to the end. We will be an overcoming people. Sadly, that's not a guarantee. But it's a great start. And so, this morning, this is our introduction to purity. And when we, when we talk about purity, some feel nervous and, and others simply feel rebellious. You're not going to tell me what to do. You're quite right. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm trusting that the Word of God and the Spirit of God will speak to all of us, will touch our hearts. I previously made it clear that the gospel of Jesus is not a religion. It's a relationship, and it's a way of life. The wonderful thing is it's not a stop that gospel. It's actually a gospel of grace, even though it is a gospel of obedience. And so sometimes we do have to let go of that in order to take hold of something else. Sometimes our hands are simply too full to take hold of what God has for us. So it's quite possible that we have to let go of certain things. In Matthew 1 verse 21, you don't have the verse, don't worry about it. It says, she, speaking of the Virgin Mary, will give birth to a son and you will give him the name Jesus, which means the Lord saves, because he will save his people from their sins. You will give him the name Jesus, which means the Lord saves, because he will save his people from their sins. And note that it says he will save their people, his people, from their sins. Not in their sins. He will take them out of, he will save them from that. So way back, I want to just touch on, on three portions where we are called out of in order to go into. Way back in the Old Testament in Joshua chapter 3. It refers to the, um, it's the, it's the moment just before the Israelites will be crossing over the Jordan. They are still in the wilderness. They're at the brink of crossing over the Jordan in flood, as we know. They're going to cross over from the Jordan, from the, from the wilderness, through the Jordan, into the promised land. And this is what it says in Joshua chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim. It wasn't a great place. And they went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went through the camp, giving the following orders. 
when you see the ark of the Lord of the covenant, or when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord, in other words, representing the presence of God, and the priests, who are Levites, who are carrying the ark, the leaders, when you see the presence of God, and when you see the leaders of God carrying it, when they see them move out and follow. When you see the presence of God moving and the leaders moving with that, move out, follow it. Because then you will know where to go. Since you've never been this way before, but keep a distance of about 500 yards between you and the ark. Do not go near it. And then the critical one is, Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do great things among you. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do great things among you. Secondly, I just want to touch on three. I'm not going to preach on any of these. Consecrate yourselves. Purify yourselves. For the Lord is about to do great things among you, even from the old days. Jesus said, she would remember to the lady caught in adultery. This is in John chapter 8. After Jesus said to the crowd that wanted to stone her, let him who is without sin be the first one to cast a stone. You know how they all went away. And eventually Jesus said to, them, said to her, Jesus, oh, sorry, <laughs> Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? There's no one condemned you. No, no one, sir, she replied. And then Jesus said, Then no then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Go now and leave your life of sin. I will not condemn you, but I'm also not prepared to simply tick the box and smile at the sin. Go now and leave your life of sin. And then We've heard earlier when the crowd came to Peter and on, to the apostles in Acts chapter 2 and they were cut to the heart and they asked that, that vital question, what shall we do? Brothers, what shall we do? Peter answered, repent and be baptized. And so there we have it. Three different occasions. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do great things among you. Go now, leave your life of sin. Repent and be baptized. The thing is, as God's people, as those who want to be the prevailing church, that are becoming the prevailing church, I want you to, to realize just for a moment, I want to interrupt myself, you are fully saved as you sit here. Don't, don't go out of this place suddenly wondering whether you are saved, wondering whether your salvation holds true. I'm not talking about justification. I'm talking about sanctification. That's if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are indeed not saved. But even though we have received Christ as our Lord and Savior, although we've been justified, there's a process of sanctification. Therefore, we need to consecrate ourselves. We need to wait in the Holy Spirit and live our lives of sin. We need to repent. It may be that we feel quite offended by this. This, this might sound like a bit of a fire and brimstone preach this morning. It might really feel that I'm speaking to the wrong audience. I mean, you're here and you're there. You switched on. You took tuned in, you, you, you dialed in. Surely th this is a, a street corner preach. This is for the Philistines out there. Maybe this will help when we read something of, of what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7. Paul, so, I so love this portion because Paul is so honest with himself. He says, I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. Please note that this is not prior to his conversion. <laughs> he says, For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good that I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, that I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, 
It is no longer I that do it. But it is just the sin living in me that does it. I think Hansi Cronier read this. The devil made me do it. So, sorry. So I find this law at work. He says, when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. When I read this, I think, I'm sure I've written this at some stage, but Paul obviously wrote it before me. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. In my inner being, I delight in God and in His law. But I see another law at work in the inner members of my being, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin that is at work in my members. What a wretched man am I. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, the one through whom we are not only saved, but by His Spirit we will indeed prevail. This is the moment for the worship team that can join us. It would seem that even for, for true believers, that while we're in this body, while we're on this earth, we will always be in the same spiritual battle that Paul has, that Paul wrote about, that Paul wrote about. Paul also write, wrote <laughs> that creation is eagerly expecting the true sons of God to be revealed. He says, all of creation is yearning for the sons of God to be revealed, for the true sons of God to be revealed. So who then are the true sons of God? Who then are the true daughters of God? Fortunately, Paul also made that clear. It's in Romans chapter 8, verse 12 to 14. He says, we have an obligation. Again, he's writing to us as believers. He says, we have an obligation. But it's not to the sinful nature to live according to that. No, no. He says, for if you live according to the sin sinful nature, you will die. He says, but if by the Spirit... You put to death the misdeeds of the body. You will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the true sons and daughters of God. All of creation is yearning, longing, desperate like never before for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed right now in this age. Who are they? Those who are led by the Spirit of God. Our journey that we kicked off this morning, our journey into purity is not a guilt trip. It is not a shaming exercise. And it definitely is not a witch hunt. Remember that Jesus said it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And then he said, I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus said, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, the sick. It's us. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. This journey of ours into purity, into becoming a prevailing people, it's an individual journey. It could, to a large extent, be a private journey. But it is definitely a spirit-led journey into the heart and into the desires of God for us to be a pure bride. For all of us who are serious and intentional to be a prevailing people. I would love for you to join me on my journey, on this journey. Not a journey of works. Definitely not a journey of works or of condemnation, but a journey into the Spirit of God. It is an invitation, as Paul said, but by the Spirit 
we put to death the misdeeds of the body. And then we will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are truly sons and daughters of God. Amen. Would you stand and, and worship with us this morning? Lord, this morning I pray that your word would have gone out clearly. We thank you that so much of what I shared this morning is pure scripture. That have basically just woven together scripture. That it's not my plans, it's not my agenda, it's not my opinion. It is your words. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd come and that you'd breathe upon your words, your desire for us, your people, to be a prevailing people. In Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, before we go into the, the worship set, Tasha had a, a word, and I'd love her to just kind of, or she had an impression as she was praying. I'd love her just to share that, and then for us to enter into worship. Um, um, I just want to actually just say um, the, the scripture again that you um, said, Basson, about um, Joshua the, uh, with the ark being there. They didn't, um, they didn't wonder, they didn't wait for it. it, it um, God's presence was just always there. And this morning when I prayed, I just felt, you know, it's, we always say, oh, Jesus, come and let your presence, he is here. Um, I just felt this morning is we actually have to use all our senses to just draw him in. Um, you know, Jesus um, in the Bible, he, he was always talking about senses um, um tasting new wine, tasting his presence, feeling, tangibly feeling him, um, hearing his voice. Um, he even spoke about senses, uh, um, the smell, to, to smell the incense of our worship, our, um, our praise and worship. So I really want to encourage you today to just tap into that. And because our senses are actually part of our fleshly beings, that's not really wanting to really connect with um, God's presence. But if we can just let our senses just grab hold of that with our spirits, we can just tap into God's presence while we praise and worship Him. And just forget about what we hear, what we see, what we feel, but just to really, really tap into His presence. Thank you, Tasha. We're going to say goodbye to our online viewers and then for the rest of us, this is a, an incredible opportunity to come into God's presence, to be those sons and daughters that are led by His Spirit. I've listened to the team rehearse this morning and it's just an awesome set chosen, I believe, by the Spirit for a time such as this.